Okay, let's get started. Are you ready? Okay, so let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the AI Plus Tableau User Group for APEC Time Zone with Andy Cutgrip and Ruth Yu. I'm Rika Fujiwara, APEC Read of this user group, and I'm thrilled to kick off today's session. It's our third event, and we are hosting it at 8 p.m. Japan Standard Time and 1 p.m. London Time. Perfect for both APEC and EMI attendees. In the past, I'd wake up at 2 a.m. for these sessions, but not tonight. So grab a drink <laughs> and relax. And let's dive into some amazing insights on travel and AI. Mm. We are working hard to keep this TUG global friendly. And we've got some sessions planned for APEC EMEA friendly time zones in the future. Stay tuned. And now let's hear from Adam, who, in, I, uh, who introduced today's guests and agenda. A uh, great intro, Rika. Uh, what a wonderful start to our first APAC and EMEA uh, time tug event. Uh, and as Rika mentioned, we're going to have a number of these as we'll rotate through our uh, global leadership team, with next being Joy Victor uh, uh, for the African and uh, Nigerian uh, uh, time zone as well. So hello, everyone. I'm really th thrilled to share today's agenda and introduce our keynote speaker, Despite being a little bit ill and off camera, I wouldn't want to miss this event. So we'll begin with Andy Cockery's keynote on the challenges of building an analytics agent. After that, Tableau Advanced Sitter uh, Lewis Yu will demonstrate a new tool for web scraping that doesn't require any coding. Uh, followed by uh, first of its kind, I believe, at a tug event, a bilingual fireside chat in Japanese and English uh, with Rika and our co-leader and Ambassador Lewis. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Andy, uh, Tableau's data evangelist um, with many different titles, but uh, that's one of them. Uh, widely known for his work in IronBiz, uh, co-hosting Chart Chat and co-authoring the Big Book of Dashboards. Andy's research and nuanced thoughts with AI and Tableau is insightful and I'm excited to hear about his hurdles he faced while uh, helping develop uh, this innovative product. So if you see Andy in the wild, you may be entertained with a little bit of magic. So without further ado, welcome, Andy. Uh, thank you so much, Adam, Rika, uh, everybody organizing this uh, user group. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing seeing the enthusiasm uh, for Tableau and AI uh, grow and grow and grow. So delighted to be able to speak on the APAC uh, edition today. Let me share my screen. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the title slide in a minute. Before I start, I have two questions to ask everybody who's attending. Uh, and just type yes or no into the chat box to answer these questions. So my first question is, how many have used Tableau Co Tableau Agent since it was released? So I'm just interested. So have, have any of you actually got the, got your hands on release Tableau Agent? Interesting. So most of you are saying no, isn't it? Right. Yeah. You see, isn't that funny? We we've spent a lot of time investing in this feature. Uh, we asked a lot of you to help out and uh, provide help in developing it. And strangely, we haven't given many. It, we've made it hard to access. So I'm sorry about that. Um, it, it, it's in the Tableau Plus uh, sales skew, but you can always get in touch with sales leadership and say maybe we could widen that. But don't, that, don't tell them I sent you to say that. Uh, second question. Uh, how many of using... Are you, are you are using AI tools, so like Claude, ChatGPT, Gemini, for data analysis, specifically for an app, not to do some sort of AI stuff that helps you do analysis somewhere. Who's doing data analysis in these tools? So Viraj says yes. Now, I, Will, I, I know some of you doing using Gen AI a lot to do analysis elsewhere. But uh, yeah, a few of us are trying this out, right? Okay, so that's great. 
maybe in the Q and A there'll be a chance to I can ask you to tell me what you're doing. So uh, Adam has already done most of the end, so I don't need to do a great deal. I'll tell you, uh, I passed my 13 year anniversary at Tableau a couple of weeks ago, and it's getting it's almost my, my 17 year anniversary since I first downloaded Tableau as a customer. That was in November 2007. It's been an amazing journey since then. Uh, yep, I get to do IronViz, have my newsletters, and chart chat as well. This is our video series on YouTube and LinkedIn every month. Our next episode is going to be amazing. Um, it's November the 13th. We had to postpone. It was supposed to be this week. But we've got the legend, Georgia Lupi, uh, talking about her data humanism stuff in a few weeks. But anyway, co-pilots. Sorry, agents. We renamed them agents. This talk is based on what I gave internally back in January. Um, I want to do two things in this in the next sort of 25 minutes. First, give an idea of what was going on behind the scenes um, and how we went from a first working code to the code we released. It was definitely a roller coaster. And the second thing is to talk about what's still a challenge fundamentally with uh, chat bot agent co-pilots inside analytics tools and how we're trying to work hard to address them. Uh, I also want to really emphasize that um, I don't take credit for what the team achieved. You know, I was there in the background cajoling, encouraging, and talking about my experience as a data analyst. But what they achieved as engineers working on this product was incredible, and I'm incredibly grateful for them allowing me to come on the journey with them. So uh, I'm not an AI developer, but I am a data analyst. And as Adam said, I've done a lot of work uh, in the last couple of years trying to work out whether these this emerging technology of Gen AI can actually help us do data analysis. To bury the lead, it struggles, but it's moving quickly. So who knows where we're going to go um, in, in in our next stages. Uh, I've just noticed Charlotte asked, why did we rename Copilot to Agent? Uh, well, it's because... Uh, we wanted to, as an entirety across Salesforce, talk more about using co-pilots for deeper, more assistive roles. Uh, so as you see the roadmap for co-pilot, which I'll touch a little bit on, you'll see we're trying to build it into something that is more than just type something and get a response. So that's the uh, reason, Charles. Uh, I've talked about the engineers. I love the engineers. They're amazing people. Uh, a lot of what I'm talking about applies to all Sort of, of these co-pilot or agent things inside Tableau or Power BI or Excel. I've tried them all. ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, they're slightly different beasts. So again, I'll touch on that. Also, you are encouraged to disagree or agree or share questions or comments. So please, as I talk, just go nuts in the chat box. I can see the chat uh, and we'll have a chat. I'll, I'll try and adjust comments as they come up. Back in January, I did this talk, um, and these were the things that I was concerned about with trying to bring Gen AI into Tableau. And I'm going to go through each one of these, but talk about how that's changed and where we are now. So one thing I'd realized that Gen AI gives us a spectrum of touchable, touchable um, outputs. Most of what we do with most Gen AI is mostly text-based. Right, type something into ChatGPT, get text output. And the brilliance of this is that it is immediately touchable. Whether you paste it into Word, an email, code script, or even just put it in your brain to think about, you can mush, edit, reword, and really work on that really very, very quickly. So it's very touchable. On the other end, things like uh, image generation and early generations of video generation aren't touchable at all. So here is chat gpt drawing um, old man roller skating in central park now on first glance this looks awesome it's old man skating in uh, uh, central park but you get this problem very very quickly this guy's got something wrong with his feet this guy is straddling a bench and he must be about 40 foot tall and this poor woman has no legs um, and as you look at every single roller skate they're all absolutely garbage they don't look like roller skates at all Roller skate is a great benchmark to check image generator power because there's not much roller skating training data, so it doesn't do them very well. But this is a spectrum of touchability. And an early question was, oh my gosh, it looks to me like actually 
the co-pilot stuff we were building back then isn't very touchable. Part of this problem was because the early stuff we built was Figma demo. So we were imagining what would happen. And I was like, well, if you type something in and it returns nine or 10 pills in a single iteration, that's not really touchable because that is an overwhelming new amount of information to be added to a this. So I was really worried about that. As we developed and worked on the co-pilot, we realized that almost every prompt would actually just return maybe two or three uh, pills. What something on columns, something on rows, something on detail or filter. And that actually felt a much more uh, touchable than I had expected. So this one became less of an issue. We're obviously trying to fix that and work, and work on that as well. Internally, we're also thinking more about customizability. And this is where the move from co-pilot to agent comes to be. You know, can we actually begin to customize the agent um, internally a little bit more so that it was tuned to our environment, to our data sets, um, and, and, and tie it into across the agent force and Tableau Einstein work we're doing. The second one is the antithesis of flow. Uh, you may have heard of the work of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, genius guy who did a bunch of research about the concept of being in a flow state. And he his work said that you are in your best place when you are doing work which isn't too easy, it's not too hard. It's just kind of in this sweet spot where you're a little bit challenged, but you're still comfortable doing it. And the challenges you're doing don't create uh, a high amount of anxiety because, you know, you know the, the tasks you're doing are quite hard, but not, not too easy, right? And so you're in the middle and you get this sense of flow. And I'm sure most of you are Tableau users. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, hands up or emotes on. If you, have you ever missed the meeting because you've been, had been so lost in data analysis analysis in Tableau. I have many times, and that's like the sense of being in a flow state. Gen AI, uh, certainly ChatGPT and early versions of the Copilot went like this. You would type in a prompt. You would immediately be in anxiety mode. Did I create a good prompt? Will I get any, a response that makes sense? Was it worded correctly? And then you would get bored because it would take a long time to respond. So and as, as soon as you're beyond five or six seconds, you're going to task switch and go and look at the news or go and play Wordle or whatever else you do. And so you end up in this absolute non-flow state. And this is a real challenge. Now, ChatGPT mitigates some of this by typing text as it thinks about it. Uh, and we added some little in, uh, UI animation to our co-pilot to give you that sense of forward movement. But this is a hard thing. So how have we dealt with this? Well, uh, first of all, internally over the last eight months, the response times for Copilot improved so much. So the first working code, we were getting 20 to 30 second response times, which is really bad. We've managed to get it down to about between eight and 12 seconds, depending on your, you know, you know on, the, on how you, how all the all the connectivity is working. But it is so much better. It's not there, but it was a massive, massive focus of the team. You know, I know Adam gave us lots of feedback. Will gave us lots of feedback. We did speed things up. One of the other things we're doing into the next phases is bringing in reasoning models as well. You've seen, you might have seen ChatGPT's 401 uh, reasoning. We're bringing that kind of stuff too. So what will happen? You'll get a visibility. You'll see the progress being made. You'll see more complex. Uh, actions being enabled and um you know hopefully that will create this sense of flow because you can see the agent doing its work all right one that i care well i care about deeply about these but what is our goal when we release agent what is our goal in giving everybody access to a data analytics tool and a platform called tableau but we want more people to be productive with data we want more people to be productive with tableau uh, and of course, one of the challenges is, are we teaching people to fish or are we giving them a fish when we use generative AI? The phrase goes, if you teach a man to fish, he will fish it forever. If you give a man a fish, he will eat for one day. Josh Moroni does a, had this great video on YouTube talking about knowledge gaps and how you gain knowledge based on how much you know already. 
Uh, and his concept is if you're using chat GPT to just get over some small gaps, then these actually become knowledge gains because you can see how chat GPT went from one step to the other to cross that small chasm. But if you're using chat GPT to do things you know nothing about, then the knowledge gap is huge and you don't actually get a knowledge gain when you do these things. Now, this is the, I, I find this an interesting thing because I've done things in chat GPT based on paradigms and coding languages I know nothing about and I've got jobs done, but I haven't learned the skill of that coding language. So that makes me think, well, what kind of data analyst do we want in 10 years time? If you are a leader of people and leading you know, entry level data analysts in 10 years time, do you want those people to be skilled in data analysis or do you want them to be skilled in writing data analysis prompts? I like to think that the answer will always be that, that, that we want this one, right? There is part of me that increasingly thinks if they can just write data analysis prompts, they're still getting the job done. But I think ha I still think having the fundamental knowledge is way, way better. Uh, Charlotte says, I hope the former. Yes, I hope the former. Um, I mean, if, the, if they, uh, yes, I hope the former. We, we, I'd love to know your thoughts as well. You know, who agrees, right? Um, but how have we addressed this in our own agent? Because at the moment, we say, hey, you're new to Tableau. Just type in a question. It'll build a viz. You've done it. We haven't really taught you how to use uh, Tableau at all. So I'm going to show you something we're working on, which may or may not come out to release um, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. So this is, uh, this is one of our internal servers. And I'm just going to show you something with the wildlife strike data. This is my favorite data set in the world. It's the number of times wildlife hits plane. Planes in the US, morning doves have hit planes in the US 13,900 times over 30 years. All right. But forget the wildlife strikes. I want to learn how to use Tableau. So I'm going to click on the agent icon uh, and I'm going to ask it, how do I build a scatter plot? Now, at the moment, I have to put slash help at the front of it. But I want to be taught how to fish. So I've pressed enter. Uh, this is this one hasn't been optimized for speed yet. So we're going to have to wait a few seconds. Um, but this is something I've wanted to see for ages. And Joe, who may or may not be on the uh, call, has done a lot to help on this. Here is how to build a scatter plot. Um, so it's saying prepare your data and then open your workbook and let's put uh, total cost on the column shelf and number of incidents on the row shelf. That's what it says here. And then that is the scatter plot. So Tableau will automatically create a scatter plot, but then it says add dimensions to additional detail because currently I've only got one mark. So let's put aircraft type uh, onto what well, it says onto color shelf. And here you go. And we've got. Uh, um, drab phase of flight as well. Let's phase of flight onto detail. And I've now learned how to do a scatter plot. Oh, Joe says hi. He's here. So hi, Joe. Uh, right. So I've now learned how to do a scatter plot. And this is an easy to follow instructions. So it's available to me. The other thing you will notice is uh, some of these little links. And what's brilliant about this solution is this is some summary detail, but if I click on the if I click on the link, then I go and get, in this case, to the Tableau help file, and I can see much more uh, in-depth details. And we're hoping to bring links into uh, data frames, blog posts, the videos, you know, community-related content out, that's out there. But we will ensure you get those links are given to you, so you so that the data fam gets the joy they want from those things. So what have we seen here? This is me using Tableau Agent to learn how to fish. Uh, I'm really excited about this feature because that's what I care about mostly. Uh, right, so uh, Charlotte says, it makes me nervous that people won't learn the fundamentals. They won't get the grounding. The, co the grounding in a coding language. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I hope that by making the ability to learn the fundamentals in 
in here more easily, we'll get people learning those fundamentals using an agent uh, more efficiently. This little flag, not on technical challenges. What I'm showing you here is not officially on the roadmap. Uh, where there's a few technical challenges internally, we have to hurdle before we can uh, get this air into the wild. I hope we can because this is a really, really big, powerful change in my opinion. Will says, very nice. I agree. All right. The text box of infinite expectation. Here's challenge number four. ChatGPT launched, uh, or OpenAI launched ChatGPT, what, 18 months ago, and it was amazing. We all learned that you can type absolutely anything into a text box, and it will give you an answer. And then all the vendors, Tableau, Microsoft, everybody said, hey, we're going to build this kind of stuff inside our product. And thus, because of that infinite expectation, we ended up in the situation where people thought they could ask really vague, open-ended questions and get a response. But about six, seven months ago, you go to your data and ask a action-based insight question or don't understand your question. So you'd lower your expectations. What are my top five customers in each region? And then I don't understand your question. And you'd lower your expectations again and just be like, just show me a bar chart, please. And then it would draw your bar chart, right? So, so this was not a good experience six months ago. Uh, and we've really, really worked hard to try and solve this. And again, we're going to keep going uh, to fix this um, as we carry on. So I did this yesterday. I thought I use the wildlife strike data to ask a really open-ended question. How does it work or how does it solve the problem? And it now begins to solve the problem because we've made a huge amount of effort in getting the co-pilot to look at the metadata and to begin to use reasoning to understand what the data means rather than just be looking at fields and columns and dimensions and numbers. So for example, when I ask this question, what hits planes and where, and how should I reduce that happening? I actually get a working answer. Now, this question is unanswerable. This is the, the, the data set doesn't tell you how to reduce wildlife strikes. You know, the, that answer is about making sure wildlife doesn't fall into airport space, right? So that it can't answer that question. It can have a go. Uh, so what it actually did was draw a sorted bar chart for each airport and then aircraft types. What I found is each time I type this question, it does something different. Uh, but it's always going, this should help identify and begin to answer that strategy. And I think this is a I, I'm, I think this is a brilliant move forwards because it's having a go, right? And it's telling you what it's done and why why it's had a go at doing what it can. So we've tried to get there. Um, you know, you've still got to ask data related questions. Also, the um, reasoning the reasoning aspects we're adding are going to strengthen this as well. When we add when we put this into agent. Um, each step of its process, it will be uh, the agent will be checking its own results. It will check at the very end whether it's reasonably answered your question. So it's much more aware of its own, whoop, of, of its own boundaries, and I think that'll help everybody in the long term. There's some comments. Um, yeah, I'll come back to the comments on uh, teaching to fish and that kind of stuff in a minute. Right, uh, the real data sources are not clean most of the time we demo agent or even tableau we're using superstore or clean data sets but real data sets aren't like that uh, what we're looking at here is a, uh, my, a dashboard i use every day and it's based it's strava data so as in yeah walking and running and it tracks am i on target to record a thousand miles of walking and running this year uh, so the light, the chart says basically how far ahead am I or behind am I on any given day of the year? And back in about March, I was uh, about 5K ahead of goal. Now, to build this dashboard, I have Strava data. This is the data. But to build a dashboard, I have to put in all these extra calculations and then all these extra calculations to scaffold and structure the dashboard for like tool tips and reference lines and access um, things to fix access right when you ask agent a question based on this data set based on distance for example 
how the heck does it know which distance field I'm going to refer to? There are 15 fields in this that have the name date distance in them, but only one is the actual distance that I would ask a question about. So at the start, with agent at the moment, we say, well, look, you should really just hide the fields you don't need and then agent won't look at them. But that's not practical in a data source like this because they all need to be visible to build a dashboard. The thing you need to do, and this is, or the thing I've needed to do to make it better with what we currently have, is something everybody should be doing with their data sources anyway, right? You can see almost all these fields are calculations I built in Tableau. So that is an inefficiency, it makes a slow workbook and it makes maintenance a nightmare. In order to fix this problem with what we currently have, I had to go and rebuild the entire data model uh, at source. So I did it all in prep. Uh, I had, So there's now no cut, well, there's just two calculations. I even brought in Fitbit data, but everything is now uh, fully documented. There's metadata and comments on every field. And now when I use agent on this data source, I've built a more robust data source at the source of the data that then downstreams with better performance and better responses in agent. So I think AI has forced us all to recognize we need, we need to be better at building more robust data sources. Better data in, better data out. Uh, you may have heard we've got a Tableau semantics layer coming as part of Tableau Einstein. I think that'll, uh, again, encourage people to do uh, better and stronger <clears throat> um, data modeling, which will achieve the same thing. Uh, I'm running out of time a little bit. So I'll just say with Monolith, uh, we're building a, an exclusive service so that, um, you know, agent stands a little bit more alone. But I don't want to dwell too long on that because instead I want to talk about this last one and talk about exploratory data analytics. It's really complicated. If you've ever seen me speak about data literacy, you may have seen me talk about this. Here's a simple data set. Data set. What is the right chart? Well, it depends on the question you're going to ask, right? Each one of these questions is a valid question to ask of that simple data set. And each, um, each one requires a different chart. Now, as Tableau users, you know you can drag and drop really, really quickly and get through all these answers in a matter of moments. We're trying to use an generative AI, even Tableau agent to do this is really hard. And it comes down to what Ethan Mollett calls the jagged frontier. If you are not reading and following Ethan Mollett, you really should be, he's absolute AI genius. Um, so let me talk about the jagged or the frontier and the jagged frontier and why that's a challenge for us. So imagine a castle, right? This is your castle of knowledge. And imagine a scary world outside your castle where there are monsters and things you can't do. You don't know anything about that. There is a frontier between these two things representing the boundary between what is easy enough and what is too hard. So things here are really easy. Things here are pretty easy, but this is too hard for you to do. That's fine. You're a human. You know your frontier. The challenge with AI is that this frontier is not straight. It's what Ethan calls a jagged frontier. And that, that means that when you're doing tasks with agents or any AI, some of them you'll find, wow, I thought this was really hard and this AI found it really easy. But others, it might find really hard. And that might be true even if logically they feel the same. So asking for different types of calculations in Tableau agent might feel logically just as difficult, but are actually very variable according to the code required to do them. The challenge with the jagged frontier is that it's invisible. So you might be using a copilot, uh, trying to explore data, and then things that you assume would be easy don't get done. And this is a really frustrating experience because you think, well, I could do that. Why can't this? And this is a real challenge for copilots uh, now. It's a challenge for uh, Gen AI. We are trying to uh, fix this. Uh, reasoning is going to be uh, give us better options on this, but it does remain one of the challenges I think is fundamental to uh, Gen AI based exploratory data analysis. So I'm going to take some questions in a moment, uh, or we might have run out of time for questions. 
But these are some of the challenges we faced. Um, we've tried to address a lot, a lot, as many as we can. Joe's online here. Joe is working very, very hard with the team to continue and improve these. I can't wait to see what comes out. And obviously, we'll bring uh, people like you here in the group all the previews as soon as we can. So I'm really interested in your thoughts. Uh, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite songs ever is Public Image. I could be wrong. I could be right. That's what I said to the dev team back in January. These were just things I was thinking. And the dev team did an amazing job uh, getting to where we released Agent back in August and continuing to work on it. Uh, so I'll pause there. I don't know if we do have any time for questions, Adam and team, or I can start addressing some in the Q&A. Um, I see Yost says Moravec's Paradox is a good example. Yes, Moravec, yes, that's true. But anyway, for now, thank you very much. That was awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, we'll give a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone's got them, please yeah, put them in the chat. I see Joy's first up with a question, Andy. Uh, I, Joy, I, I'll ask Joy, mate, uh, Joy, you could come off mic. What do you mean by the fourth wave? How are you defining the fourth wave? So basically the whole AI revolution, basically. Uh, well, without a shadow of doubt, we need to be writing it. I mean, this this is what has the transformation in AI in the last six, seven years has created an emergent technology where we we don't really know what it can and cannot do. This is part of the jagged frontier, right? So everybody needs to be looking at ways um, to do this, whether we're a vendor like us or Microsoft or you know any of our competitors or Salesforce, also as individuals, right? So we have to be... It, so even, you know, where age, our Tableau agent is, might be like, oh, it's not as good as we want it to be. We've got to be out there pushing these features, seeing how customers use it, working out the, the good bits, the bad bits, and how to keep pushing that frontier out or evening out, that, evening out the jaggedness of the frontier and pushing it further out away from our castle of knowledge. So, uh, I, I mean, it, so to answer the question, Joy, it will create new opportunities, new successes, and yeah, probably a few bits where you're like, what were you doing when you did that feature, Tableau? Can you not change it? Uh, obviously, we'll try to keep those as minimal as possible. Good question. Okay. Thank you very much, Andy. That was great. I really like seeing some of the behind the scenes there as well. Um, yeah. Uh, if people want to follow up with you, where should they go and find you? Uh, QR code to go to my newsletter. That'll get you to LinkedIn as well, because I don't go on X anymore. So LinkedIn is the best place to find me. Call it the Exodus. All right. Thank yeah. you, Andy. Yeah, um, indeed. But... Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Next up is probably the hardest working person I know, uh, Lewis Yi, uh, <laughs> hosts the uh, Singapore User Group co-host of Games No Viz uh, with me and a few others. Uh, we've got an awesome data set as well if you're doing Iron Viz uh, coming up. So do check that out. But hosts a lot of things like Secrets of the Viz, a great YouTube series about looking and understanding people's visualizations, a lot of interviews there. Um, and has come along today to talk about a no-code tool for web scraping. So I will hand it over to you, Lewis. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Phil. Uh, thanks again, Adam, Will, Rika, and Joy for inviting me. Uh, I think this is a very interesting time to talk about web scraping because we're right in the middle of IronVis. Uh, there's still time to get more data. Uh, we still have like two weeks, uh, so don't be afraid. Um, so what I'm going to do today is going to share a little bit on what I've done uh, and how I've used AI to simplify the process a little bit. Uh, so let me share my screen um, and yep. and there we go so hopefully everyone can see my screen yep that's great all right so seeing this the the ai uh tableau user group uh i actually asked ai to create a portrait for me uh and this i mean Will, Adam, and the team can uh, can confirm for me, but we don't have a T-shirt like this for Tableau Ambassadors. So this is totally AI generated. Uh, and it did a pretty well uh, job. I mean, I look uh, pretty in shape. 
uh, as opposed to real life. But uh, yeah, I thought this would be a fun thing. Uh, so I have a QR code that that uh, goes to my kind of collection of links. Uh, Will has actually given a wonderful introduction for me, so I will not go deeper into it. So let's jump straight into it. Uh, yes, there's a lot of icons on my desktop. Uh, that was being caught up in my previous world. Uh, but OK, so the title for today is No Code, No Drama, Scraping Without the Sting. Um, so everyone knows, you know, with the, the introduction of the internet, you know, data is everywhere. We live in a very data dense society these days. And the most traditional way of getting data off the web is your traditional copy and paste, right? Copy uh, through the internet and paste it in like an Excel file or notepad or, or so on and so forth. But over time, uh, a lot of websites have started to offer an alternative through API calls. So API call stands for Application Programming Interface, which is a set of instructions that you can uh, send to the server to retrieve certain information in a structured manner. Um, but unfortunately, not all websites have this feature. Uh, you have uh, like Spotify and Netflix, which has API, but if you go down to other websites, uh, say for example, when I was doing the data set for the game type this, uh, a lot of the websites like Wikipedia or Met Metacritic didn't have an API. So we had to do it the old fashioned way. And uh, over time, uh, when people started to understand more about APIs, uh, people started to create their own scripts uh, through Python and uh, R to actually scrape the data in an autom semi-automatic uh, fashion. But it's not for the faint-hearted because there's a lot of programming that goes behind it, right? And what I'm going to show you is a quick example of the difference between scraping by yourself and API, right? So this. Uh, is a very fun project that I did for my uh, cornerstone uh, for my uh, master's program. So it has kind of like just a, a bar chart of all the Marvel comics released from the 80s to I think 2022 when I last did this. And there is a lot of comics. Uh, we, we will take you about three years to finish everything. Uh, but I didn't copy and paste everything from Marvel's website. They actually had an API for me to do it. So they had this developer website that you can actually get an API key, uh, and you just need to read through their API documentation on what are the syntax around the API calls. And this is just a snippet of how it looks like just to get started. So you need to have your developer keys. I've already uh, masked it. It's not all X. Uh, just for security purposes. But uh, after you get the keys, you actually have to hash it uh, and pass it back to the API because they can't, it's also for security because they can't actually handle your exact uh, security key uh, because that would be kind of personal, personal identifying. And from there, uh, what you actually need to do is, you know, go through a cycle of frustrations, uh, just getting, to understand uh, the limit behind the request limit uh, because they don't want you to crash their servers as well. So if you are sending out you know, 1,000 requests every second, you know, that's going to cost something called a, a DLDS. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but basically it crashes the website uh, and it gives you kind of like a black screen or something uh, or the, uh, a 404 server page. Uh, so a lot of the API calls have a set limit of how many data you can pull at one time. And usually, usually it's about you know, 1,000 or 2,000 rows of data, uh, which is not a lot, especially if you're trying to script a lot of information through the API calls. Uh, and yes, well, uh, you can get blocked if you try to go above that request limit and try to kind of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, force force request uh, through it, right? And even after you get through uh, the this circle of frustration where you finally understand you know, the cadence of uh, how many requests uh, you can actually send through, there's also another uh, layer of complexity where you need to understand what is available. And it's often not, uh, I would say not all websites document that very well. It really depends on the developers themselves. Uh, and sometimes you have 
um, I would say similar data in different data structure in different granularity. So if you don't really understand how the different data structures relate to one another, chances are you'll be pulling out duplicate rows and uh, you know uh, data that is not usable. And I actually faced that a lot when I was doing my master's program. Uh, it was so annoying. I took it took me almost about two months just to get the data right. Uh, just doing script, because there was a limit of a thousand rows that I can uh, pull out, and there were more than a hundred thousand comics. Um, so you can imagine the amount of frustrations as the deadline creeps towards me. <laughs> and, you know, if years ago I had this AI uh, solution, I would be so happy. But unfortunately, back then we didn't have that. So this is uh, uh, API core in, in a nutshell. Uh, if you were to do it yourself, you know, uh, chances are you'll be looking at websites like this where they have some sort of semi-structured data in a table former, uh, format. And what you need to do is you need to write, find the right data. You can't have a, uh, you can't kind of scrape a data that is, I mean, you could scrape like a paragraph, but it doesn't really make sense. You can just copy and paste, but chances are when you are doing web scraping, you want to do grab data from a, kind of like a tabular format. And it's not easy from this point of time because you need to inspect the HTML and understand where the data sits in the particular hierarchy. So there, depending on how the web developer develops the website, it could be nested after nested after nested uh, table structures, and it's it's not pretty uh, at the end of the day, All right? And even if you find that name, All right, extracting the information using Python and uh, R takes a bit of programming knowledge. So there's a lot of code that you need to write to get through everything, right? And uh, back to Will's point, uh, if, because when you're doing it yourself, you can sort of bypass the request limit because it's not set by anything by, by yourself, but the website will potentially flag you as a, a bot or something and potentially block your IP address or, or so and so forth, and you can't access the website anymore. Um, and there's also something called a, a robots.txt, which a lot of websites maintain in their root structure. And this text file actually determines uh, what bots are allowed to scrape their websites and what are not allowed. And the links to the uh, website structure that is visible to the public. So if you try to scrape anything that is not within this list, you know, chances are they will come after you. All right. So, why doesn't this work the way I want it to? <laughs> There's a couple of reasons, right? The first thing is the website manifest, which is the, the robot TXT, is blocking your, your crawler, right? So when you're writing Python script, even though you have like the perfect code and you have the names and everything, uh, you don't get the data because sometimes the, the text file, the, the robot text actually blocks the traffic. And uh, poor HTML coding practices, uh, and this is, uh, th there's no right and wrong to this because different website developers, you know, code their website differently. So even if you write the code perfectly for this website, if you try to use this exact same code for another website, I, I can guarantee you 100% it will not work because the names are different, the structures are different, so it's really annoying. And uh, the data retrieve, uh, when they're doing their their uh, website, uh, there will be cases where some data might be uh, kind of parked outside of the HTML. They could have been using a, a retrieval method uh, using JavaScript when you click on the button and stuff like that. Those are not web scrapable, uh, unfortunately, because it has that additional layer of sending additional requests to the server. There's also dynamic and uh, responsive web content, which is also not scrapable. Um, there's also encryption uh, or quotes, uh, scripts that they uh, put with the website to disable uh, any crawling. And there's also IP address blocking. And this usually happens when you try to do too many requests to a certain website and the, the webmasters flag you out and basically blocks your IP address, All right? So like Avril Levine say, why do you have to go and make things so complicated? So today I'm gonna kind of 
talk to you before we go into the AI portion of it. I want to talk a little bit about ethics, right? Uh, you know, the internet is kind of like the Wild West. Uh, so why is there a need for ethics, right? Uh, there is no law, uh, I mean, legally to fault people for web scraping. Uh, there are laws around copyrights and IPs and stuff like that. But as responsible data users, uh, we have to teach people to do the right thing, right? And uh, these are just some of the implications of misuse of data, right? Uh, some of the data that they have on their website could have investments tied to it, right? Or they could contain personal information, right? So you try to scrape that, uh, although it's not, uh, it, it could, it could, uh, potentially roll into a lawsuit because there's personal information involved. There's also uh, the problems of data being inaccurate. So if you try to scrape data, let's say, for example, Wikipedia versus Metacritic for games, chances are some of the data might be different. Uh, they might get their, they might be getting the data from different sources. So there's, there's a bit of kind of data cleaning uh, to be done as well, All right? The data could be part of that program. So uh, in recent years, there have been a rise of data as a, a software, as a, as a product, uh, as a service. So they sell kind of uh, like analytics suite uh, where they have data streams from like a panel um, uh, or, or focus, focus groups data that they kind of extrapolate to represent the data, uh, the, the market itself. So the things like, you know, uh, GFK, uh, uh, Nielsen insights, those are not scrapable. If you try to scrape that, you might get into trouble. Um, there's also unfair market condition. And what I mean by this is that sometimes uh, competitors use web scraping to scrape uh, what their uh, prices for their competitor products are. And although there's no kind of law around this, it's kind of usually frowned upon because it creates uh, unfair market conditions for the entire landscape. And there's also the problem about uh, plagiarism, right? So with all this in place, how do I be an ethical web scraper, right? First thing is, if there's an API, use the API, right? They are created uh, for the use of, for, for the purpose of giving you the data in a structured manner that they have verified and uh, tested. So anything that you try to scrape outside of API may not be tested uh, well. And always respect the robots.txt uh, file because that is uh, what most of the websites do these days. Uh, always read the terms and condition, right? Uh, I know a lot of us don't, uh, but usually for every website, there is a TNC right at the bottom. So go and read that and see if they allow you to get data or or any, or they usually has like a paragraph that says that any data within our website uh, should not be uh, replicated elsewhere and stuff like that. So those are kind of your uh, triggers to understand if the, the, the website is scrapable. Um, and if all fails, you can always ask for permission, right? Most of the time if you ask for permission, you know, they, People aren't selfish in nature. So, you know, if, if you can come to a, a negotiation for, you know, mutual uh, benefit, most of the time they would, uh, you know, allow you. Because for, for me, when I was doing my master's, uh, there was this guy that did like uh, a transcription of all the comic book sales uh, from physical receipts back in like 70s. Uh, and he had it in the database. And I didn't want to kind of scrape it and not, you know, ask him about it. So I actually asked for permission and he said, you know, uh, go ahead. I, I I don't update it for after the nineties, but anything before that you can, you know, free free to use it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just as simple as asking someone for permission, right? And uh, what I would advise is that you try to scrape to add value instead of duplicate the data uh, for your own purposes, right? So for example, uh, you know, now that we have IMDB data, if you, you know, get scrape IMDB data and put it on your website and kind of resell it as your own, then that's not ethical as well, right? And 
kind of be nice and be gentle to the servers. Uh, don't try to scrape like 1 million rows of data at one time because that will crash the servers and all. And lastly, give back if you can. So if you have created a data set that you know, uh, is based on several different uh, web script uh, websites, you know, you can always ask if they want that data back uh, to kind of enhance, and it helps to kind of build a better ecosystem, you know, when we, you know, help each other out. So uh, in today's era, there is a lot of AI tools that can do web scraping for you. Uh, but what I've, I've tested a couple of them, but what I find myself often going back to is uh, Browse AI. All right, it is used by a lot of big boys uh, like Amazon, Google, apparently Salesforce uses it as well, uh, and Spotify and all. So uh, I'm going to throw a question to the crowd. Do you guys have any website or anything that you want to scrape? I can do a live demo and show you how it's done using this tool. If not, I'll just go with a list of my own. Any takers? No takers. <laughs> no worries. All right. So, uh, Pebble Public, maybe. Let's see. Uh, we might be able. Uh, let's see if you want to script. You know, the visit of the day. Uh, th there is a public a Pebble Public API, uh, but for demo purposes, we can do that. Um, Andy, if, if, if that's okay with you, <laughs> we can <laughs> Okay. All right. So this is uh, the Browse AI uh, website, right? Uh, just ignore all, all the robots that I've been testing. Uh, but basically, when you have uh, an account, uh, you have kind of a limited number of credits that you can use to scrape, but they reset every month. So you can, you can survive on a free account for quite a long time, unless you're trying to scrape millions of records from um, the server, all right? Uh, but for us, what I'm going to do is we're going to build a new robot, all right? So just click on this. Uh, there's two there's two methods that you can use. Uh, one of it is monitor site changes. Uh, this is usually used for gathering competitor uh, advantage, uh, which I haven't really used that much. Uh, but the other one, which is one that I often use, is extracting structured data. So once you click it, uh, they will ask you for a link, right? So we can go ahead and let's see, copy this link over, All right? Uh, it doesn't need to be logged in, and you can start the training program. So there are two options. You can install the Chrome extension, which was the original version, uh, but lately they have actually increased, uh, kind of released a new uh, in in browser experience. So you can actually click on this robot studio. And just give it a minute or so. Probably not a minute, yeah. Okay. Just a little bit more. Okay. So here on the left hand side, you can actually see how the, the 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 website looks like, right? There's two options. You can capture a screenshot, uh, but that's usually not. Uh, I mean, it's not really what we want because we want to capture the text instead. So you can go ahead and click on capture text, and there's there's two things you can select. One is just text, which you need to select uh, everything that you want to select. Uh, you want to script, but there is a list function which you can click. And what this does is that now you can hover over the different sections of the website and it highlights where the collections are, right? So for example, now you can see that there's list one, list item two, list item three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and this goes on uh, as long as there's data uh, at, at the bottom of the page. So you can go ahead and click. And now uh, by default, it chooses it automatically. So you can see that now it has the visualization title, it has the author name, the view counts, and the visualization link. And you don't have to do anything. It's just one click, right? Alternatively, if you want to do it manually, you can also do it. But oftentimes, the um, automatic way is 
pretty pretty all right like it does pretty well uh you can select the number of rows uh do you want to extract so for example i want to extract the top 1000 right um and you can see that now it only has like 12. Uh, you need to select the pagination setting, right? There's a few settings to go through. Uh, that is clicking on the next button, right? So you click on this, they, it will ask you to click on the next button. So for example, if I click on this, then they need they will ask me where is the next button. So for example, if this is next button, you can click on this and it registers that. So when they script, you know, the first 10, uh, it gets to the end of it, it clicks on this button and it goes to the next one. Uh, the other options is uh, scroll down to look more, which is what uh, Tableau Public is. So you can click on this uh, and you can see, uh, you can just name this, let's say VOTD and uh, maybe let's not do 1000. Uh, I might crash. I, I'm not too sure if I would break anything. Uh, Let's do 200, <laughs> All right? And then now you can do a finish. Okay. And do a save and just let the code run for a bit. All right, so you see that it's kind of simulating the user actions. And you can see a very small number over here, 12. Uh, so I think it's my PC might be blocking something because it's on my work laptop. But generally, you should be able to see like 200 rows over here. As, as they scroll down. So you can go ahead and download this as a CSV or a JSON. Uh, and let me just open up and show you how it looks like. All right, and there you have it. Perfectly no code method of web scraping. Uh, let me see, let's do this. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Maybe I can go one step further. Uh, so there's actually uh, a way for you to automate all of this extraction to a Google Sheet as well, right? So if you go back to the dashboard, let me just uh, let me just remove this first. Then let's do it again, and I show you how it's done. So build a new robot. So when you click on build a new robot, uh, let me see. Oh, wait, sorry. I should have. All right, never mind. So uh, just take this as an example. So once you have the task uh, saved, you can actually go over here, uh, which I don't know why my account is not allowing me to change. Let me see. Yeah, okay, this works. Uh, so there's a uh, integrate function over here. Uh, sorry, settings. Where was it? Somehow it kind of disappeared. Yeah, this is a live demo, so we are facing some technical difficulties. Uh, uh, don't worry, Lewis. I think <laughs> let's, um, let's, uh, we've seen quite a bit to get inspired by this, so it's, it's all good. Um, Okay, the other thing I you can do is as well if the uh the script has uh kind of like embedded links. Uh so for example, let's say if I go back to the file that we did earlier on, right? You have all this. Let's say I want to script the profile links, right? So I have this, I can go over and let's say I just take one of this. All right, and I create a new robot. Can actually fit a list of uh, a CSV file for them to script rather than uh, just one website. Because sometimes you need to script like a nested view. So for example, this is Prasant's uh, Tableau Public Profile. 
right? So, for example, if you want to scrape some statistic on him, uh, it's not loading. Why is it? Yeah. Okay, I might. I can do things like. Okay. Wait. Funny enough, this doesn't allow me to change that. I just refreshed it. Ah, okay, there we go. So let's say I want to capture very specific text. All right, so I'd say I want to capture the number of visas that he has. Uh, I want to capture the number of favorites that he has, the number of following, and number of followers. All right, and then I can click on confirm, and then this would. Uh, Ask me to name the data field itself. So favorites, uh, following, and followers. All right. So you have all these four uh, things that you want to capture. You can go ahead and finish it. And now, the, what you could do is that you can. You have to wait for it to finish the task, right? And then finish the setup. And you can now do a bulk run task, right? So you click on this, it actually asks you for a CSV. So you can download a sample. Uh, and then this is how the sample looks like. All right, so you have this origin uh, URL. So you can go ahead, let's say we take this entire chunk and we paste it over here and we save this. Okay, we don't need this. And now if we drag this over, you can see it loads all of the lists within the CSV itself. And now you can actually uh, integrate uh, Google Sheet. So I, I, I misspoke earlier on, uh, the only way you can integrate Google Sheets if you do a bulk task. Uh, so it runs in the background while you close this window and go and do other stuff. So if you click on enable, you can choose a you know authorized account. Uh, you can log in. You can select a current spreadsheet or you can create something new. Uh, you know, testing for TP. All right. And then you can create and activate the integration. And now you can actually go ahead and run all 12 tasks. All right. And you can actually see this. Uh, let me just open up my Google Drive and find that file for you. Recent testing for TP. There we go. So over here. So you have this one, All right? So it has already finished the task. So you see, uh, you can see it live uh, as they are adding the data as well, and the the runtime and the job link as well. So you have like all the visas, the origin URL. All right. So that is all I have for my demo. Hopefully, this is useful uh, in this crunch time for I have this. I would say. Okay, okay, thank you so much, Lewis, for this demo. Um, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciated it. Appreciate it. It was really lovely watching it. And um, in the chat already, and um, we had people who were already trying it out. So that was really lovely. Thank you so much. Thank Up you. next, thank we have. Sorry. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure having you. Um, up next, we have Rika. So um, yes. we know. We're a few minutes. Yes. A few minutes with Rika. Um, Rika is absolutely amazing. And um, she's basically putting Japan um, on the spotlight. And um, we're so grateful to have her here. And she will be taking the fireside chat in a few minutes. So the floor is yours, Rika. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Here, here we are. Dewa bilingual chat. Hajimemashou. But let's start bilingual chats. Since we don't have any enough time, 
あまり時間がないので、Let me just one question. 一つだけ質問させてください。Hi, l u i s h i l u i s これまで Web スクレーピングで取得したデータで一番に便利だったデータは何ですか ?What has been the most useful data that you has obtained through Web s c r a p i n g I have to say the Gabe's Type Vest Starter Kit、uh, because <laughs> it, it was a good two to three months of scrapping. Initially, I had,、uh, I was just surviving on the, the free trial、uh, credits and it wasn't enough. So I actually bought it to <laughs> accelerate the, the scraping process because we actually scrape data from three different websites How Long to Beat, which has all the game completion times. Uh, Metacritic that has the ratings、uh, or the, the critic awards for the games, as well as Wikipedia with、uh, the game description, the genres, and release date and platforms and all. Thank you, Ruiz. So let me check your script. <laughs> But, I know this, Ruiz is going to say, Starter Kit, Starter Kit of Game Night Biz, right? Yes, ゲームナイトビズのスターターキットに使うのに非常に便利だったというふうに聞いています。で、えっと、で、このスクリプトのデータっていうのは3つの異なるウェブサイトから来ていて、まあ、これを集めるのに非常に便利だったというふうなお話が聞けました。ちょっといかがでしたでしょうか結構ちょっとチャレンジングなあの心みで、since this is the sort of the challenging event, but hopefully you, especially Japanese、uh, attendees,、uh, enjoy it. 特に日本の参加者の皆さんに楽しんでいただけたなら幸いです。ありがとうございました。Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Here, back to you, Joy. <laughs> ah, you are on mute. Sorry. Um, I said this felt like watching anime just without subtitles. It was really cool. <laughs> so, thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to our speakers.、Um, thank you for asking questions and just engaging in、um, our event. We really love having you here. Please,、um, you can always leave your feedback. You can reach out to us on、um, LinkedIn or Twitter. And、um, it was lovely having you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a nice、Bye. day.